All right, so here we go. Let's look at number one. So today's topic is scientific investigation. So the first fact that you need to know is the steps to the scientific method. So the first step of the scientific method is always to state a problem or question. You need to know what it is that you're trying to find out. Right. And just so you guys know, sometimes on the SOL, instead of them saying state a problem, sometimes they call the first step make an observation, which means the mm -hmm. same thing. Because in order to state a problem, you have to have a sense of what's going on in the world around you. So we should write that down too. The second step is to make your educated guess or prediction on what you think will happen, and that is called a hypothesis. So we're going to say make a hypothesis. And again, Ms. Hines just said it, but you want to make sure that you know what the definition of a hypothesis is, which is just an educated guess. Pretty simple. Let's put that down there too. All right, step number three is going to be to perform a controlled investigation. So we should probably talk about what a controlled investigation is. Yeah, and just so you know, when we use the term investigation, it means the same thing as an experiment. experiment. So we're using lots of different terms because really the SOL is a vocabulary quiz as much as it is, it is a reading quiz. Mm -hmm. And so the, the problem or the beauty, I guess it depends <laughs> on how you feel about biology, is that there are multiple ways of saying the exact same thing. Right. So we're trying to use as many of those terms as possible because we're not really sure what the um, testers or examiners are going to be looking for on May 22nd. Right. So remember, a controlled investigation is one in which you only change one thing at a time and you keep everything else the same, just one. And we'll talk about what those parts are called, the parts you change, the parts you keep the same in just a sec. Okay. And our last step, Ms. Hines? Is going to be to analyze your results or your data and draw some conclusions. Okay. And um, sometimes does the SOL refer to it as um, state a theory or have a theory or conclusion? Yeah. Yeah. A theory can, can also be a part of your conclusion. And actually, a theory, though, implies something very specific, which leads us to fact number two. Okay, so number two says a hypothesis becomes a theory only when it is supported by lots of evidence or experiments. The key there being lots, not just one, not just two, but a whole lot. And remember, this is very different than the way theory is used in real life. In everyday life, anybody can have a theory about anything. But in science, if you have a theory, it means that it's supported by lots of evidence. So basically, a theory is something that's held as true. Right. Not like how we use that term in society. All right, let's look at number three. The most reliable source of scientific, scientific information is a science journal. Now, here's the thing. On the SOL, when they ask you this question, and trust us, they will. They ask it every <laughs> year. They're going to give you a series of options. So they'll give you like a science textbook mm -hmm. or a tabloid magazine or a newspaper. And then inevitably, there'll always be something that has the word journal in it. We always want to pick whatever the answer choice is that has journal in it because a journal is a, um, a publication that is timely, meaning uh -huh. it's published often and the information inside of it um, is true and it's based on current information that we have. Um, we don't want to use things like newspapers because scientists don't publish newspapers. Right. Um, and we don't want to use things like tabloids because tabloids are by definition, magazines that contain false information in them. And a science textbook, if we think about our textbook in the classroom, our textbook is what? O over 10 years old. And so we know that there's some information <laughs> in there very much. that's not correct. Okay. All right, let's look at number four. An observation is information that can be collected using the five senses. And just so you guys know, because when we asked at the beginning of the year, there was some uh, discussion as to what the five senses were. But your five senses include sight, so being able to see, uh, being able to hear, being able to touch or to feel, being able to taste. And then what's our last sense? Being able to smell. All right, so those are our five senses. Um, and so we use those five senses in order to gather information about the world, which helps us make observations, which lead us to figuring out whether or not there's a problem that needs to be answered using the scientific method. All right, let's look at number five. An inference is a? Um, an idea or prediction based on an observation. So an inference is not something that you can see or smell or hear or touch or taste, but it's an idea or a guess that you can make based on your observations. Okay, so let's look at number six. Number six says a 
qualitative observation is based on, we're going to say descriptions or letters. So remember, a good way to remember this is you can think of the L in qualitative as standing for letters or words. Qualitative observations have only words in them, so they're descriptions of things. Yeah, and what you can also do is think about what word is built into qualitative. It sounds like the word quality. So if somebody mm -hmm. was asking you about the quality of your sneakers or the quality of your clothing, mm -hmm. you're not going to you're not going to tell them how much your shoes cost or what no. size they are. You're going to tell them whether or not they feel good, if they're soft, if they're made of leather, so on and so forth. All right, let's look at the next one. A quantitative observation is based on, well, it sounds like the word quantity or it has the letter mm -hmm. N in it for numbers. Right. So it's based on numbers. So let's highlight that N and write numbers underneath for our memory clue is based on numbers. Yep, so if somebody asks you what is the quantity of money in your wallet, you would give them a number. Yeah. And uh, what we always say in in um, our class anyway, I always use the example if I said, Miss Cook is ugly. Is that qualitative or quantitative? Well, I didn't use any numbers, so that's a qualitative description. Right. And if I said Miss Cook weighed 350 pounds, that would be a quantitative description because it All uses right. a number. All right, let's go ahead and scroll up here. Okay. All right, so here's number eight. There are five important parts to a control experiment, and this is probably one of the most important things yeah, on the Yeah, I would actually put a star next to this one. If there's nothing else you learn from this SOL review from today, this is the one part you want to know. Yeah. So let's start with an independent variable. Oftentimes it's referred to as an IV, so let's put that there because if you see that, we don't want you to get confused. So what is an independent variable in an experiment? Because they're going to have to be able to identify that. Right. There's a lot of different ways to think about independent variables. So one way that helps me remember it is I think of I for independent, and then I remember the independent variable is what I, the scientist, change on purpose. Yeah. So it's something that I am in control of that I change. And something to remember Remember guys, when you're reading a scientific experiment, one of the easier tools that you can do or tricks mm -hmm. to help you figure out what the independent variable is, is just put your name in the experiment. So everywhere there's a scientist's name or another person's name, just write in the word I or write in your name and so that you can ask yourself, what did I change while I'm reading the experiment? Some other ways to think about independent variable, again, you can think independent, it's the input, it's what I put into the experiment. We can also think of the independent variable as being the cause. A lot of experiments are looking at cause and effect, so mm -hmm. the independent variable would be the cause. All right, let's go on to the dependent variable, and we know there's a relationship between the IV and the DV, the dependent variable. The dependent variable is just what you are measuring in the experiment, right? So it's what is measured. Yep. And it depends on the IV, which is where it gets its name. It depends or responds to the IV. And instead of being the cause, like the IV, it's the opposite. What is it? It's the effect. Awesome. So there are lots of different ways that you can train your brain to think about the IV and the DV. We will tell you, guaranteed on your SOL, there will be multiple questions asking you to either identify or to... Um, well, I guess really just to identify the IV mm -hmm. and the DV. And typically, just so that you don't get confused, typically the IV and the DV will be stated in the very first sentence of the question. Right. So you always want to look in the first sentence for those two. All right. Let's look at number, or I'm sorry, letter uh, C, experimental group or groups. So in an experiment, you're going to have different groups or setups. The ones where you add the IV or where you change, where you experiment with something, those are your experimental groups. So we're going to say the ones where you add the IV or where you change something. And sometimes there's just one experimental group and sometimes there's a few. Yeah. Um, they're pretty simple to find, though, because if you can isolate the IV, all you have mm -hmm. to do is ask yourself, well, who received it? Right. Um, let's look at uh, letter D, the control group. This is really important. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, it defines whether or not an experiment is valid, if right. it's any good. So what is a control group then? So there's, again, a lot of different ways to think about it. One way to think about the control group is it's the group to use for comparison. Um, so it's the one that you're going to compare all the other ones to. Some other ways you can think about the control group is sometimes it's used to represent the normal situation, what is normal. It's also the one that you don't add the IV to. Um, 
Um, so that's three ways to think about the control group. Right. So, in, and in our classes with Cook Hansen, we always have a little chant. The control group is a thing that stays the same. You need it to compare. So if you know that, you'll be in good shape for the SOL or any questions they might ask nice. you. So it's a thing that stays the same. You need it to compare. All right, the last thing that we need to look at in terms of important parts of a controlled experiment are things called constants. Nice. And these are the things that stay the same in the experiment. And sometimes they're easy to confuse with a control group. The control group is the whole group or setup where things stay the same. But the things that stay the same throughout the entire experiment are the constants. Yeah, so it's things that are the same for both or all the groups in an experiment is also another way that you can think about it. In all groups. And that's key. All right, so number eight, super important. If I were you, I would make flashcards for A through E and mm -hmm. be able to identify them. But you're going to have plenty of opportunities today to practice, and you can also practice after school with us or during lunch. Right. All right, let's look at number nine. We're almost done. Yeah, okay. Number nine is all about graphing. We've talked a lot about graphing this mm -hmm. year. Um, the reason why is because graphing is super important topic on the SOL. Yep. So let's talk about its parts and, and why we need to know them. Okay, so um, on a graph there are usually two axes, the X and the Y, um, and we talk about the X and the Y axis in science class, but in math class I mean, but in science class we want to relate that to our variables. Right. Um, so we want to remember that the IV is always on the X axis and the DV, the dependent variable, is always on the Y. And you'll remember we gave you a, a way to draw the axis to help you remember this. You can draw the I as forming the bottom of your graph and then the D as forming the Y axis. So I can see my D is the vertical and my I is the horizontal. And we also gave you some other ways to remember it. If you look at the letter X, if you were to draw it, and you put a cap on the top and the bottom, it actually looks like a diagonal I. So it's an easy way to remember it as well. Right? So we have lots of different uh, memory clues to mm -hmm. help you remember. Um, and the great thing is, and lots of people get afraid or they shy away from seeing a graph on, on, um, on a question, but if you see a graph or a picture or yeah. a table or a diagram, <laughs> these things are always your friend. They're giving you more information and they're giving you information in a friendly manner without words because right. sometimes it's the words that confuse us. So if you remember these simple tricks, these things never change. Graphs have been used this way um, for forever, and they will continue to be used this way. Nice. All right, let's look at our very last thing, microscopes. Ms. Hines, we have not talked about microscopes in um, a, a very, very a, long time. A long time. So it's good that we're reviewing them right now. Okay. Um, so the most important thing to know about microscopes for the SOL is how to calculate different parts of the magnification. Um, in particular, the SOL likes to ask you about the total magnification of the microscope. And the way you find the total magnification is by multiplying the magnification of the eyepiece times the magnification of the objective lens. And we're going to go ahead and label those two parts on the picture for you because oftentimes it can be confusing. So up here at the top where I would place my eye if I was looking through this microscope is the eyepiece and then down here right above the stage right above the place where I put what I'm looking at is my objective lens. So we have our two um, numbers. We know that our eyepiece is mm -hmm. 10, and I will tell you, and Ms. Hines will tell you, that the eyepiece is always going to be 10, yep, which means that the math is going to be really simple. Mm -hmm. You're either adding a zero or subtracting a zero, depending right. on how you're working the equation. So for this particular microscope, we have the eyepiece being a, a total magnification of 10, and we have the objective lens, which is a magnification of 60. So all we have to do is multiply those two numbers together in order to figure out what the total magnification is of the entire right. microscope. So when we are multiplying by 10, what mm -hmm. do we do? We just have to add a zero. So so our awesome. total magnification is going to be 600 X. Now it's important to know what this means. Um, what this means is that if I looked inside this microscope, this object would be 600 times larger than it is in real life. And Ms. Hines, what if we wanted to go the other way around? What if I told you uh -huh. on the test that the total magnification was 1,000? Okay, so, so my I total already is know thousand. my total. Uh -huh. I want to know what the objective lens is. Okay, so I'm going to think to myself, if I want a total magnification of 1,000, I know my eyepiece is always 10, what number can I put here that when I multiply it by 10 by my eyepiece will give me the total magnification that I want? Um, and again, I know that when I'm multiplying by 10, I need, um, it's going to add 
add one zero to my number. So I just need to ignore one zero for a sec in order to figure this out. And I know that it's going to be 100. So are you saying that with just this one little math mm -hmm. trick, I can figure out any math problem about microscopes? Oh, yeah. Man, you are lucky to have us. <laughs> All right, guys, use this information to answer the rest of the questions on your SOL review. And remember, there is going to be a practice quiz at the end of the period to see whether or not you need more help with the material. Hopefully, you'll all ace it. Yep.